I'm Alice Berkeley of Cullum, North Dakota. Okay, Alice, uh, tell us about, tell us that you grew up on a farm and tell us what that was like. I grew up on a farm about 10 miles south of Fredonia and farming was hard. It was in the 30s and we didn't have much to go on, so. Well, tell me, you told me that one time you were out with your dad and it was dusty. Tell me that story. Yes, I was outside and we thought it was really dust storm. And then he looked up and he said, I think we're getting rain. And I looked and he said, they, the closer they got, it was all grasshoppers. And they were just all over. We had to go into the house. They were terrible. And would it get so dark? Tell me about getting how dark it would get with the dust storms. Oh, you had to put on your lights, and we put our kerosene lights on in the house. We had a mandel light, but those we kept only for special occasions. So. Did you guys have enough to eat during the depression? Oh, yes. We never went hungry. We had chickens, ducks, and geese. And my folks always raised pigs. We butchered every year. Two pigs made sausage, head cheese, summer sausage. So we never, and we had a garden too. My mother had one right beside the tank. And we had another one that they called the bastun that was made out at the farm, uh, away from the farm. And uh, we did potatoes, pumpkins, and watermelon, all that stuff out there. So. And I don't know, uh, I know in the dry 30s we didn't get, we got a few potatoes, but my dad went to Fredonia and there was a guy that went to Fargo and he'd get cucumbers, potatoes, cabbage, and I guess my folks had money to buy it because then we, at least we had some of the things. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what type of farm it was that you grew up on? Oh, it was a small farm. My house was very, or my house was very little, just two little bedrooms. And what was supposed to be the living room held a stove, pot belly stove. And uh, my mother got a dresser for her wedding gift and a little place behind the door where we put nails. Those were our dresses that we used for real good when we went to church and someplace else. And what type of crops did you grow in the farm? Oh, they had wheat, my dad had flax, and oats we always had, barley, but never got that much. My dad had kept wheat uh, before all this came, and he had quite a bit of wheat. And my he would take in wheat to the column mill, and he'd usually come home with 600 pounds of flour. That took care of us, we didn't have to buy that. The only sugar that I remember they really used was the honey. And a guy came around and he'd sell us five gallons of honey and that's what we used for a lot of sweet stuff. Did they barter a lot? Did you barter a lot? Barter? No, I don't think so. Not that I know of. Well, you were telling me earlier about going to town and what a special treat that was for you. Why don't oh. you tell us about going to town? Oh, we went to Fredonia. On Saturday night, if we were good and behaved, we could all go along to Fredonia. We took the eggs up that bought the grocery. We took usually two 10-gallon creams of, uh, to the depot and put it on a car there, and Mandan Creamery would pick it up, and then they'd send us the check in the mail. And otherwise, we'd, we went into the store. We each got a nickel. And we went and that was the first time we had heard of cold shots. It was ice cream bar on a stick. And I remember my sister was always a little faster. She'd go in and she'd come out with one while the rest were out on the car yet. <laughs> so that was a big treat for us. And then we could go outside and there was different people there. And we could play with the different kids there. We weren't, we usually were supposed to be seen and not heard. How big was your family? Uh, there was four of us. My mother lost her first baby, boy, and then I was born, and then was my brother, Arthur, he was next, and then Aida and Perlene. What, so, what, what type of chores did you do on the farm? Oh, we had to get the eggs, get the eggs, and if there was clucks on there, you had to throw them out, they'd pick at you, 
and we'd have to feed calves and clean the chicken barn, which we didn't like. And my mother raised a lot of her own chickens and we'd have to, she had a brooder and we'd have to go in and clean that out and different things we did. You were showing me pictures earlier of your ancestors. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your ancestors and coming from Russia? Okay, uh, the ones coming from Russia is my great-grandfather. He was John Schilling, and his wife was Christina, and she, her maiden name was Nanke. My grandfather was John Schilling, too, and Christina, and she was a schlep, and she was born in Russia, too. And then my mother... She married Gus Whale, and she was a shilling, and they, I can't remember when they got married. How about, so you said that's your dad's side of the family? Yes. What about your mom's side of the family? Well, this was my mom's side that I said to you, the oh, shillings. Okay. My dad's side was Philip Whale, and he married Christina Rutt from Ashley, and they had a big family. They had 10 kids. My dad was the oldest, John was the next one, Henry, Albert, and then they had Bertha, Dina, I think that, I can't remember. There was some later that came later. Why don't you tell me about uh, your grandparents and your relations with your grandparents? Okay, my grandparents, we stayed, my brother and I especially stayed there a lot when my folks would go to Ashley because when they wanted to do more business, they went to Ashley because there was more people there, you know, that had different things. And we'd always stay at my grandmother's house. And oh, she was so good to us. I remember every Christmas time, she had 14 grandchildren, she'd come up with a candy bar and her hanky and a quarter. So we got that every time she came to visit. And when we were there, she'd always bake cookies for us and I could help her sometime, which she maybe didn't eat, but I did, I wanted to help. She was so good to us. And Grandpa Schilling, he was a little more, you had to be quiet and not hurt. He didn't like us noise. Then one other thing I can remember is me and Art would go and she had this big, thick feather bed. And we would just love to punch a hole in there. And she'd go in there, she'd be put, so put out with us, she'd take her stick and it had to be perfect. She was very, oh, crocheting. She crocheted bedspreads and I never got one. The, her daughters got one. I didn't need one with five kids. <laughs> why don't why you tell me about, you were telling me a story about um, your mother making all of your clothes. Your mo my mother made her, her, our dresses and she'd buy order material through the catalogs. And then if she had one pattern, she'd lay it down. And we never, we had one bit button in the back and otherwise it was just a plain little simple dress and that got hung behind our door which was a closet and we could only wear it to church or when we went someplace. We, otherwise we wore, she usually made pants for us, she made everything for us and we had little shirts and then later on I remember we got a Sears catalog and I looked at it and I said to my mother, order me a dress. And she said, well, you have to have money for that. I said, well, dad still has check blanks. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> Your dad was quite a record keeper, though. He kept books, didn't he? Yes, he did. Oh, he was r real good on that. Everything, his gas uh, that he bought, that was in a book, which I, my brother had. But otherwise, when he was thrashing he had perfect records of everything. All the neighborhoods, he was the only one in the neighborhood that had a thrashing machine. But later on, he got a, we had a neighbor that he was gonna order a six foot combine. Well, he didn't want it, so he called my dad. And my mother said, if you don't buy that little six foot combine, I am not cooking for those thrashers again. Because she always had a cook. Every time it rained, they'd all come to her place They'd sleep on the hay barn. I thought to myself, when did they take a bath? Like here we do it so often and they just, finally my dad did put a big barrel out 
and he put a hose on and they could come home. Because there is usually six that worked with the wagons that brought the bundles. And my dad had a guy helping him with the tractor. And then there was two that hauled the grain away. So she had about 10 people to feed all the time. I don't know how those women did it. They baked everything. They had to make lunch. Usually, uh, I remember those guys staying there. She'd have five o'clock breakfast for them. Well, at nine o'clock, she had to have lunch out for them at the thrashing machine. Then at noon, she had to have a big dinner and a big pot of coffee out there for all the guys. Then at three o'clock, you had lunch again. And then they came home at maybe seven or eight when it got dark. And then they had another big supper. But she usually had a hired girl that helped her because they made everything their own, the buns, the bread, the pies, and everything that went out there, cookies. So everything was homemade. We never bought anything. The only thing we ever got was at Christmas time, we'd go to Fredonia. And I don't know if you remember, they had these brown things. They looked like a shape of a banana. Can you remember those? And you'd put them in the oven and you'd heat them. And there was a lot of, they were really sweet, but they had a lot of seeds in them. And we'd always get that. And then my mother would buy maybe two oranges and two bananas. And then it was four of us kids. And we'd each get a piece. And someday I thought, I'm going to eat a whole banana. So <laughs> that wasn't a big deal now anymore. Did you learn to cook from your mom? Oh, yes. I had to learn. My mother always said to me, if you don't learn how to cook, your husband's going to bring you home. <laughs> So what type of things did she teach you how to cook? Oh, I had to help her with everything. We, I had a, the thing I hated most was when we did geese, we had to pick those fine feathers first so we could make pillows with it. And then you had to scald them and do that. And then we did chickens, we did ducks. She had turkeys one year, but my dad said no more turkeys. They messed up all his lean touchette. And so that was the end of that, but, and, so tell me some German food. Did you learn how to make German food? Oh yeah, the Knöpfel and the strudels and the Dumpf noodles. I don't know what was the difference between the Dumpf noodles and the strudels. One was, a, they were still made out of dough. And yeah, I still make all those. When my kids come home for Christmas, that's what they want. Sauerkraut. And last year I made about eight gallons of sauerkraut. That was enough for my family, but now my daughter, she's going to make, she's going to make 10 gallons. Did you, gonna... do you teach your children how to make German food? Oh, yes. Some of them, they want to learn, but it doesn't always work out that good. I had a, my son that lives in Somerset, Wisconsin, she wanted to come and learn how to make. <laughs> she was so proud of hers, but I didn't say anything. They didn't turn out that good. <laughs> I said they were fine, just fine. So. Going back to a little bit earlier when you were a child, you were telling me that um, it was until oh, it was high school before you actually got a dress from the store? Oh, yes. When the first dress I got, even the ones went to, I went to high school were homemade. But when we went, to, when I graduated, I got a dress. And that was bought at a store. And I got a purse. And I wanted high heel shoes because all the rest... And we went to Bismarck. I was never so upset because those heels were terrible to walk in, and we stayed overnight there. You know, and that was a big deal for us, but I thought to myself, that was stupid. We had to have a purse and those high heel shoes because, and everybody else had one. So that was our trip to Bismarck. And then you were telling me about getting a wedding dress, too. Oh, yes, yeah. so we went to Aberdeen. When I told my folks I wanted to get married, and then my dad, mother said, we're going to Aberdeen. So we went to Aberdeen, and I know there was a Chewy store there, and everything was cheaper, so my dad said, we go in there. So the first dress I tried on was $17. He said, that's too much. There was another store down the basement. So we went in there, and we got it for $12. And I borrowed the veil, and I had a cousin that had a white Bible, and we had a lady that made all the flowers for all the tables and a little flower for on my white Bible. And that was it. 
for the wedding. You told me the wedding was large, though. Oh, yes, we had 300 people. I have a book here that, and my mother made everything. They butchered two pigs and made frying sausage. She had potato salad. She had pineapple rice. Coffee cake we made. We took a bed out of the, living, out of the bedroom, and her two aunts came, and they helped her, and that was full. And we had a wedding cake that a neighbor lady made in town here. And pork and beans she even had, which I thought was unnecessary, but we had a good meal. But, oh, beautiful flowers. That lady decorated everything, all homemade flowers. Never had <coughs> any real ones. Why don't we go back a little bit and um, tell me about, you were talking about uh, learning German and German being your first language. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't know any different. We had to learn everything. My dad would sit with us at that little book that was, we, every Saturday night he'd sit with us. And if we wouldn't listen, you know, we got a big one on the head. So we had to listen because he'd read to us. And then when we went to Sunday school, Mrs. Rutt was my first Sunday school teacher. And we had to learn the ABCs to say in German. And I can still say them. And, uh, Go ahead, say them. Oh. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, V, V, X, X, L, N, Z. I can remember. We had to learn all that, and that stays with you. When, when did you actually have to start learning English, then? Oh, I started learning English when we went to school. And thank goodness there was a teacher there that could understand the German, because none of us could speak English. But she stayed at my folks. And she helped my mother because she was going to become a citizen to learn the preamble. And that's, we had to learn it with it too. The pledge to the flag we had to learn. And she helped us with, oh, the tables were terrible when we got to those. But she was so good with us. She worked with us and stayed there for practically nothing. My mother just kept her. So, and my mother learned English through with her. My dad knew English, but my mother and my grandparents never did. So when you were around your grandparents, you had to speak German, I guess. Oh, yeah. We had to speak German. If we spoke English, they said, Mi verstehen dich nicht. They'd always tell us. I knew that. What does that mean? <laughs> they don't understand me. Yeah. Oh, I can still talk German. I, my mother, when she was here, we talked a lot of German. But now I don't do it so much. The kids laugh at me when I talk it. I so said. Tell me about your school. What type of school did you go to? Oh, it was a little country school about a mile north of us, and we always had to walk to school. And we had a, one teacher one year. He was a man. And, boy, we had it really good there. He'd have opening exercises, and he'd let us go out and play until noon. Never opened the door. The doors were locked, but we made fish. We made snow houses, and we had a good time out there. We had Auntie over when it was uh, nice, you know, we played. At noon, he'd call us in. We could eat. At one o'clock, he told us to go out. Until I went home one day and I told my dad, Boy, Dad, I said, we sure had a good time today. He said, what were you doing? So he came up and he found him. And I remember two of the older boys that went to school there, they went in one day and they even pasted on gum on his nose and he never woke up. And my dad fired him on the spot. And then we got a teacher, and we had to learn. Boy, it was hard week because we didn't know nothing. Nobody did anything, and it was from to one to eighth grade there. And she had she had a hard time with us to get us all back into, you know, back to where we should have been. Back in the rhythm, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then you went to high school. Where'd you go to high school? Column High School. My mother always said. If I have to work day and night, you kids are going to get an education because I never had one. And she did. We all went to high school, except Art. My brother, he came to town and he hated school. And he'd be down at the John Deere dealer sitting on the tractor. So my dad came on into town and he found him and he said, you better go home. You aren't going to learn anything in town here. <laughs> so, But we all graduated there. And then I went to Allendale for a summer term because... I was going to uh, teach rural schools, and I had to go eight weeks, and then I could teach country schools. And did you? Oh, yes. I taught six years.
And where'd you teach? Right uh, north, of, I don't know if you know where the Berlin Baptist Church is. Okay, I taught there for five years, and then one year we moved over south of Cullum, and then uh, after I was married, and then I moved one year. I, li li you know, had school there one year. But uh, the one year, to start with, I only had six students. And then, then the next year, then I had 13. And I had a hard time getting all those classes in, especially, you know, a lot of them needed help. But the parents helped a lot. I, you know, I could tell they would help at home with the kids. And so. It must have been difficult to teach a one-room schoolhouse, though. No, it wasn't that difficult. What was really difficult, we had to come to school in the morning and everything was cold. We had to get the stove going and we'd sit around until noon around the stove until it really got warm. By the time it got warm, it was time to go home. And we never, we did put some coal in, but it, it never lasted overnight because there were, those schools weren't that warm either. They had big windows to the south. I have pictures of them. You grew up on a farm. Mm-hmm. And then did you marry a farmer? Yes, I married a farmer. I had to do the same, do more there than I did at home. I did everything from seeding except I would not seed. One day a guy came along and wanted to talk to him and he said, make around. Then when I came back, he said, my goodness, you drove crooked. I said, well, I had more in the road than you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I haying, you had to be out there. We couldn't afford a hired man because we had five kids. I had a little girl, a neighborhood girl that came and stayed with them, took care of them. And otherwise they go out with us or combining, especially we take them along out. <clears throat> How old were you? Very young when you were very young? The children when they were very young? You yes, they, we had a big haystack right next to them. They played on there all day long, sliding off of it. And I took lunch along out there and they'd eat. And sometimes they'd cry and fight, but that was part of growing up. Why don't you tell me about the, the, the house that you had after you were married and then buying a newer house? Oh. The first house we lived in for five years was a sod house with the mice. Oh, it was terrible. We had to have everything in jars or one night I baked cookies and I had a, my folks bought me a breakfast set and it was about maybe a foot away from the wall. And I thought, I'm not gonna put those cookies away. The next morning I had mouse turds in those cookies. I had to throw them away. They were terrible. But by the time we left, it was pretty good, except out we had a little lean-to porch on there. And I had my washing machine out there. And so my mother gave me watermelons. Well, the next morning I came out there, they were all taken out on the inside. So those rats must have had a good time there. Yeah. And then from there, we moved to a farm 16 miles south of Cullum. Well, we had to do a lot there. We bought a farm. 16,500 acres was eight quarters, and we paid 16,500 for that. But we had to do a lot. We had to put a barn there, put a, fix up the house, and we made an FHA loan, and they gave us the money to put in the water because he looked at the kids and he said, in a year you're gonna come and want to add to your, you might as well add it right away, and it was a good thing we did. But we always had water problems there Finally, we got somebody that could do a well that we had enough water for, even now yet. My son has no problem. But, when yeah. you were growing up, first when you, before you got married, but when you were growing up, did you have uh, water and electricity on your farm? Oh, no. No, we got that later when the telephone lines came in and everybody was on the same party line. And then my folks got a, a some engine or something they put in the garage and we had one bulb in the house we could burn and me and my brother didn't like it because every night if we'd come home late we could see that bulb went on so she could look at the time <laughs> but now was... did you have water and electricity in your your houses when you were after you're married yes mm -hmm. it was yeah it it came in the rural electric came in and they stop practically at every farm and put it in. So, yeah, we had that electricity, but 
I know the first farm when we were in, they brought in telephone bills, a dollar a month, and that was a lot. But it was a party line. We had, our line was one short and one long, and everybody rang that, and we, everybody listened in on what you said too. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, when I was growing up, that's our first home, was a party line, yeah. Yeah. Everyone knew your business. Yes, that's for sure. Um, what I was going to ask earlier on was, so when you were teaching, where did you live when you were teaching? I lived with a family close to the school. It was Edwin and Martha Meidinger, and they had two kids that went to school, so they always took us. If it was nice, then we walked from there. It was maybe about a mile and a half. It was right close to the Berlin Church, so... And we'd all, most of the time we walked, even if it was nice when we would go and walk. So, so why, did, why did you stop teaching? Because I got married and started raising kids. <laughs> how, did, how did your life change for you after you got married and you started having children? Oh, how dear. was your life different? Very different. You had more things to do. Our first baby was... Uh, I had to go to the hospital two weeks because they thought I had toxemia. And so I stayed there. And then he was born in March. And then we took him home and he was okay. But he was so colicky. And I'll have to tell you this, my husband didn't like, we had a lady in the neighborhood, a Mrs. Liskey, and she could do something for everybody. Every Friday night we went down there if you had something wrong with you, she fixed it. And so my husband didn't like that. He said, you're just going to a quack. And I said, no, she helped us. We went there every Friday night. So we took him down and she did whatever she did. She did something with her finger, you know, and made a cross and said something. And she hung a little red string around him. He never cried or was colicky. When I took it off and gave him a bath and my husband was sitting there, see? I put it on, and he didn't cry anymore. She did so much. If we had ringworm, which was everybody had it, we went down there. And then I remember she'd always say, we had these cover halls on, and we had, uh, she'd come and say, "Wits Auszerische. What that meant, I don't know. Auszerische in German was something that had to come out of you. And she'd take a string, and she'd put it down your neck, until it came out the bottom of, we always wore cover halls. And then she'd take it and put it in a pot belly stove and she'd make the cross and she said something, but you never, I never heard what she said. But it helped. Uh, everything we did, if we ring or whatever we had, and I know the babies, I remember ladies taking them down there and they'd take them from foot to foot, cross them like that. And that was supposed to help them. And I don't know if it did or not, but. There were so many people there, you could hardly park. Everybody came. I remember a little boy came and he was full of eczema from head to toe. He was bleeding. She went out and she browned, browned flour and she put him in a gunny sack and he was all flour. The next Friday we came down, he was all healed up. She did a lot for the people in the community. Have you heard the expression of Brauker? Oh yeah, that was her. Tell me she that. was a Brauker. Yeah, she did all these things. She'd make a uh, my dad would get these terrible boils in his neck, and she made this salve. I know they always, it, it did wonders for everybody, but my folks would, uh, my, the men would always say, she took skunk fat and made, that's why it was so good, but I'm sure that's not what she did. But it was good, it worked for everything. So, and different things, she gave you medication too. And she said, if you don't believe, don't come. And she never would take money for anything, but my mother would fix angel food cakes, give her different things that you could do. But she never, no money, then it wouldn't help. Can you just say she was a Brauker? She was a Brauker. Yeah, that's what we call it. There was a lot of ladies like that. Ashley had a, quite a few of those, but she was the neighborhood one. Everybody was there Friday night. If you had anything, I don't know, I know that one time when she did this, you know, with, with my, I don't know what it was for, but <laughs> it helped. 
And I took my kids down there too when they needed something. We usually didn't, we never went to a doctor, not as children. My dad went uh, one year to Little Rock, Arkansas. He had to have surgery. And then uh, maybe five men got together and they took the train from Aberdeen. And then they came back. But locally, we never went to a hospital that I know. You uh, started to raise a family. Did you mm -hmm. ever think that any of your daughters might be interested in staying in agriculture? Well, they all are in agriculture, except the youngest one. My daughter lives right there where those wind towers are. They live north. They're big farmers. My son farms all our land, and he rents some. And well, then Warren, he, he did start, but he married a gal that was a, she wanted to go to college, so she was a big professor in college, and he had a good school too. And then uh, Carolyn, well, she married a farmer too, but then they didn't like it, and he didn't, he couldn't, he was, had a lot of allergies, he couldn't stay. So they moved to Fargo, and he works for a farmer, Titan Machinery, and he retired from Cullum here because they closed the Titan Machinery. And now he's working for Titan Machinery in Fargo, and they're sending him all over to work for them. So he's got a good job too, because he couldn't take combining if there was dust, if didn't, he got sick, so. Never did mention your, your husband's name. Oh, Herbert Berkeley. He grew up uh, maybe five miles east of Cullum here. And the only time we ever got, uh, my brother got a car, and so we could go to town on Saturday night. And they always had dances at the old city hall. But my mother and my grandmother was thought we'd fair go to hell if we'd go to the dance. And that's where I met him. But we not we couldn't go to the dance because we didn't have money to go in. We had a fifty cents, and we didn't have it. <laughs> so, that's... so how did you in the dance and meet your husband? Well, I didn't go in. It was outside. He was in the dance, and he came out, and we were all standing around there, and that's how I met him. But then after that, we didn't really go to the dance anymore because oh, my grandma Schilling, or with when they started roller skating in town, we told her one day. Oh, goodness, she said. Kinder, was den ihr hat sie gesagt? Das ist doch nicht, das ist ungerecht, she always said. And that means? That's a not, I should say, not biblical. You know, she, you didn't do that. So your family must have been pretty religious then. Oh, yeah. Well, we went to the Baptist church there and my grandparents. And that's another thing. Uh, you know, people went together. We had revival meetings this fall and the spring. And all the local people came, and we had the biggest revival meetings. And then we'd go to the other ones, or if their Christmas programs. That was a big thing. We went to every church Christmas program. And it was usually all German. I can remember my brother, Ich bin ein kleiner Mann, ich sage euch, was ich kann. Die große lasst mir laufen, die kennt sich selber kaufen. And I had fröhliche Weihnachten und ein glückliches Neues. Yeah, that was our Christmas first pieces. After that, we had bigger ones. And we had, uh, I know we went to all the Lutheran churches around there, and they came there. The Methodists, we all, the, at Laird, there was more Methodists there. That was a big thing you went to. And then the country schools, they had their Christmas programs. That was another thing. When I had my first year, I stayed there. The parents came and they put up a little stage and we practiced. The women came and they put up wires so we could pull curtains. The women would make popcorn balls and they'd popcorn and they'd sell it for a nickel. And then we had basket socials and pie socials. And usually the boys, the, your boy, uh, the girls would want their boys to buy it. But I remember we went to one country school and this young man bought this girl's pie and she wouldn't eat with him. He opened the window and threw it out. So you've been involved in agriculture virtually your whole life. Mm -hmm. So what, what changes do you think are from when you were a young kid growing up till today? What, what have been the changes for women in agriculture that you've well, seen? Well, you still have to go out, but you don't have to 
uh, work that hard anymore. It's all done by machinery, you know, where we, I remember my mother, my dad planted flax one year and he went thrashing and then you had to drag that flax several times and she dragged that flax and he had a good crop of flax that year. And then I don't remember what, but I think it was $12 a bushel and he took it all to town. And then my mother said, and now is the time we're gonna put in running water. And he didn't think that was good either, but we did, they did. So, yeah, that. So what do, what do you think for your mom was the biggest change, you mentioned technology, the biggest change that made her life a little bit easier? Oh, she, my dad finally bought her a washing machine when the electricity came in. Otherwise she had this motor that had to run almost gassed you out in the porch and she got a washing machine and they put in electricity and they had a thing in the garage that would like a motor that would run it but you could only run we could put two bulbs in the house and I don't know what you we and he added a bathroom which was another thing after they had a little more money and then they added on and then in 1976, they built a house in town here. And then they, she, he, he got sick and she, and she stayed there. It's just two houses down here where they lived. It's Harold Fregain bought it and they lived there. And then she stayed in the house until he passed away and she stayed there until she passed away. And then we sold it to us girls did. My brother had passed away by then already. He had cancer and he passed away at a young age. How but, about for you? What was the biggest technology change that helped you uh, as a woman re relieve some of your oh, problems, whatever? Well, we built a house in town here and I finally had a, a washing machine that you didn't have a ringer or something on there. And I got a dishwasher put in and a nice double stove with double ovens. I could do a lot of baking. We did that in the house. And then we put four bedrooms in the basement and one upstairs and all the kids each had a bedroom. And they went to school in town here. Yeah, I had, and then the lawn, we had a lawnmower. I didn't have to do what you did out on the farm, but we still had to go out and do things at the farm because the kids weren't big enough and they went to school. So we were a lot out there. When you moved in from the farm, your husband was still farming? Oh yeah, we farmed until, well, maybe about 10 years ago when he started not feeling good. Then my son took over, but he was out there every day. You had to drive him around just to look, so, he, so they did everything right. <laughs> so why did, you, why did your family move in from the farm if you were still farming? because our son took over and, and he wanted to live out there in the house. And so then Herbert said, well, let's build a house in town. So that we did, it's right across from the Congregational Church here in town. And now, then when Herbert got sick, we moved here when he went to the nursing home. And then my son, Herb, bought the house. And now he, his daughter married a young man from Wisconsin, he was from the Marines. Now they bought the house and Herb and Tammy bought a littler house down right across from us here. So it's still in the third generation. The farm. The farm and the house. Yeah, Herb still farms the, everything out there and his, granddaughter, his daughter lives in there now with her family and she has three little girls, three, two and one. And when they come over here, oh, it's a little, but that's fine. So they're, they're great grandchildren. They're great grandchildren, yeah. Now what happened to the farm you grew up on? Herb still is, has it out there. Well, they burnt the house down. It was so bad, but there's a big pole. They put up a big cattle barn and they have a, a one where they put their machinery in. But other than that, they burnt the house down about two years ago. And now they have a big hole there and they throw everything in. So would that have been the farm that your great-grandparents bought? No. no. 
It was a friend of Herbert's that wanted to live closer to Cullum. He was a cousin of his, and he knew we were looking for a farm. And then we fought his, bought his farm. It was 16,500 acres, and we paid 16,500 for the farm. Boy, you couldn't do that now anymore. Later we bought land and we had to pay $600 an acre right north of town here. What, what do you think is the biggest challenge for, for people that want to go into agriculture now? They can't hardly because everything is so expensive. How can these kids start? If they don't have help from the family, like Herb bought all the combines and, well, some of the machinery didn't, like he's bought in different haying stuff, you know. We, ne we had a little round baler that was a back killer, so they have these big bales now and they can handle them. That is completely different. You, nothing is done manually anymore. Everything, augering, we had a, I remember a thrashing how they had to shovel that into those little windows in the greeneries. And now they've had these big augers and in a few minutes the truck's empty and off they go again. Do you think uh, many of the women nowadays can um, still be, be on the farm with their husband? Is that yeah, still there's possible? a lot of them, oh yes. I was out there until, even when we moved to town, we were out there and farmed. Herbert had to look to see that they did everything right. <laughs> and he'd tell them, if, oh, you shouldn't do that, but they did what they wanted to do anyway, so. So I guess this is a two-part question. So <laughs> what is the thing that you miss the most about living on a farm, and what is the thing you miss the least about living on the farm? So tell um, me what you miss the most first. The miss the most, it's just you could... It was so quiet, you, you could do everything you wanted to do out there. You had your chickens, you had everything you raised and canning, your gardens. We're in the farm here, in town here. We can't have a garden here. So my daughter-in-law wasn't gonna put in her garden, so I went and I put it in. So I got a garden. Out on the farm? No, <laughs> here in town. They live right down the street. Oh, okay. And she works as a uh, nurse in one of those new, uh, where they put the old people in, nursing home, I forget what it's mm -hmm. called, Eventide, I think. Eventide, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. She works there, and he farms, and their daughter, husband farms with his son-in-law now, and she's, she's going to be a teacher. She has another year left, and then she's going to be teaching, because her husband said, with three little girls, you better get something together. <laughs> well, he bought the farm now, the young man, Herbie Solder, because he wants to farm, but he wasn't raised on a farm. He came from Wisconsin, but he is so willing. Herb said the other day they put teeth on, a, on the rake. He said, I was working on one end, and I looked around. He had two, three done before I had one done. <laughs> He was in the Marines and he was a, a, did that stuff, you know, worked with pickups and stuff. And he has a, when he was in the Marines, he could drive these big gas trucks. So he works for the Allied Energy here. And he has to go at night and get these big trucks. And then he fills Edgeley up. And then he goes back and then he goes, comes back and fills up Cullum. And then fills the truck again so they're full. And then he goes to work at the farm during the day. He's really good. And then we, Herb has a grandson. He's a step behind him all the time. And he said he was out there, he's only 10 years old, and they harvested some wheat because they didn't think they were gonna get enough. They have about 650, uh, 450 cattle out there. And the hay wasn't that good this year. So they, then he cut some he uh, like wheat, you know, that they, and he was raking it only ten, but I said, my kids did that when they were out there, they raked, but he's going to be a farmer someday when Papa isn't going to do it anymore, so I thought, oh, you better get an education, because there's not that much, I mean, if you, there's no way a farmer cannot start unless the parents help him, that's impossible, because the land now, well, like we bought land like for $48 an acre and a farmer left there and then he said, 
I'll just tell, I'll just give it to you, he said, because nobody wanted to buy it. Everybody really didn't. But we always somehow got it paid. We got ten and a half quarters together. So that's what the kids are farming now. I get the income, one-fourth of the bushel. Good for you. Yeah. What's the thing you missed least about growing up on a farm and what things you had to do either as a kid or a farm wife or as both? Well, there was... We did a lot of things. We did visiting out in the farm. Neighbors visited each other. We'd get in the evening, we'd get the kids ready, and we'd go Sunday night. You never called. Now you better call because it, they're not home. And it, it, the visiting isn't like that anymore. Of course, here in town, we run across the street, but not like it was out there. We went visiting. I know we had neighbors that were maybe a mile from us. And us kids would walk over there because they had no children. And she always made the best cookies. And one day we came over there and she was making cake. And me and Art were sitting and listening there. And, and my mother always left a little something in there in the, uh, you know, the batter so we could lick it out. So we said to her, why don't you, do, why are you taking everything out? And she said, well, I didn't have any little kids that wanted to eat that. Yeah, that was with some of them. Were there some chores that you didn't like growing up that you're glad you didn't do? No, I do didn't anymore? like pigs. They were terrible. My uh, dad always took the extra milk and the water, and we had a five-gallon pails, and we soaked that. And you know, when you came to their troughs, troughs, they just about run you over. They were pigs. You had a. I know my. A brother had a stick and he'd whack at him all the time. So you could even get the feet in there. But then at they had it, then they let you alone. But then my dad did a lot of corn. I know even in the dry years he had a corn crib and then we take those we had to take the the corn cobs and we used them as fuel. My mother said it was the best thing to bake coffee cake with. The corn cobs. And wood. Every, nothing was, I don't know how those people, I said to my mother, didn't your house a smell when you took that? They had that big box in front of the stove and, and the manure was in there that we picked, corn cobs, wood, whatever you could find. And coal too, my dad would go to Fredonia and get coal. We had a stove in the living room and then we used it out there too, so. Must not have been fun picking up um Manure, though. Well, you we had to wait till they were dry, and we knew. And I, I've, I've walked fields now. When we kids were out, there was round cactuses on the ground, and they had little berries in there, and you could pull them out and suck that out. I have walked fields across, you know, with the CRP, and you don't see that. Uh, what it, it was red; it always grew, and they'd make. Uh, the Mrs. Lisk would always make something that was good for you. Oh, what are they? Hagebutz, that they called them in German. They had red berries on there, and you took those berries, Thank and that you. was such good tea. Okay. And she'd always make something from those, and it would help you. <coughs> Excuse you me. Hackberries? Huh? Hackberries? No. no. I don't know what they were red. <laughs> 